Hello, and welcome to The Beauty Mark. Ooh, I like that one. Um, just, you know, I mean, we're about to have a terrible storm, so I've, and I know you're going to be road weary. You have an early, late flight. I'm not sure which one, so it's just a nice, just, yeah, a nice just flower, to you, flower to you. Thank you, The Beauty Mark. Um, we are live today for the first time, so if you have any questions, please um Go to our Facebook Live and ask any questions. Um, we have the whole communications team working on this. So, uh, All please, both of them. Yes. <laughs> so please send us any questions that uh, that you might have. Um, if you can see this on video, it's even better. Basically, it's like the two of us are <laughs> sitting with like pop shields the size of hockey pucks uh, in a room with all the sort of charm of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Bulgaria. But, uh, you know, what can you do? I wanted a GoPro and like a little table, but maybe next time. No, I think it has to be the, it has to be as soulless as possible. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So in that soulless way, oh, let's yes. begin. What's been going on? Well, it seems like the president uh, has, in surprise to everybody, including, including his senior staff, agreed to peace talks with North Korea on on a dime. So is it actually peace talks? I mean, like, what are we talking about? Are we going to, like, formally end the Korean War? I mean, like, what, is, right. there, is there an agenda? Do we even know? I mean, by all accounts, the South Korean National Security Advisor came into the Oval Office and proposed this and said um, Kim Jong-un was interested. And the president, without missing a beat, said yes. And um, and nobody, the Defense Secretary, Secretary, Secretary of State, his own National Security Advisor had not been advised on this. So then the uh, Korean counterpart had to go to um, some ante room to write up the press release for uh, for this. So it, it's not clear whether it will be peace, whether this is just like a coffee. Is this like, you know, a coffee and date? burgers? Yeah, it could be. I mean, fun. you know, at the end of the day, though, you, you spend all this time turning on sanctions and turning the screw and turning off petrol and all that. And the whole thing is you want them to talk. Well, OK, now it seems they're willing to talk. So, you know, I mean, the amazing thing here is the sanctions have been hurting, right? We know this. Yeah. And if something comes out of this subs that's substantive, then uh, the president's going to look extremely good for doing this. Well, that's what I was thinking myself, is that is this a win for the Trump administration just to sit down at the table with uh, with him? Yeah, because if they do this and then, you know, things look like it's going well and then Kim Yul Twinkie stabs him in the <laughs> yeah, back, yeah, right? Yeah. Then, you know, this gives Trump license to do whatever he wants to North Korea after that. Yes. One of the questions I th was thinking about is where will they meet? I mean, I don't think they'd probably meet in Pyongyang or in D.C., but maybe they can meet in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. How about that Hawaii? That's kind of a halfway spot. I know, spot. that'd be nice. Like exactly. a tropical paradise beach, for them. On the beach, you know, a couple of, you know, I don't know, guess what, daiquiris or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, with, that could go down drinks well. with umbrellas in them. I exactly. think that'd, that'd be really golf nice. Golf umbrellas. <laughs> like yeah. giant golf umbrellas. Um... So uh, thinking about someone who's been president for life or whatever his title is, King Supreme Leader, um, Xi Jinping has also decided to become president oh, yeah, this, for this life is like, as well. This is like the fashion now, isn't it? <laughs> it really so, is. so, so think about it. We've got, we've got Putin. Yes. Right? And uh, then, of course, you've got the Koreans as trendsetters yeah. on this. Now the head of the Communist Party of China, they used to have these five-year sort of yes, rotational right. slots, yeah. and, and that seems to be on the way out. And Trump himself said, admittedly, at a correspondent's dinner, so it yeah. was a joke, liberal <laughs> alert, not everything is said seriously, that uh, it's a good idea in America should look into this. But uh, it does seem to be sort of a trend. And Do you think it's a worrying trend? Oh, I, I mean, well, it's worrying if you're not the party in power. The guy, Leon, whatever his name is, in Venezuela, who's been under house arrest. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, if hey, if you're Putin and you've been in charge for 18 years, I think that's probably a pretty good uh, pretty good deal. Um, I, it seems like, though, on a serious note, that this is quite problematic. I was, um, as I was reading about this, two delegates out of the 10,000, only two voted against it. And I wondered Whoa, where those two, Christmas yeah, cards. where are they oh, right now exactly. today? <laughs> wow. Um, so I know this is one of your favorite topics, and that's predicting. Um, Elizabeth Warren is not going to run for president. Of course, it makes no sense that she would. She's got a great job doing representing people that love her. Um, I, well, uh, at least certain portions of masses no, that's true. love her. I would that's not true. put that down for all of them. I don't think yes, Western masses deeply in love with a yes. Harvard professor. No, that's true. Everything that's like on 93, yeah. And yeah. Um, so I've been thinking about your Hillary Clinton prediction, and I keep thinking about that. Is she going to make? Is she going to make some comeback? And I have to think, as the people start to say no on the Democratic side, it does raise her profile. It does make her more possible. More of, of an course, option. of course, the nightmare will come true. I will tell you this. Um, 
So the weird thing with the UK and the nerve agent. Yeah, I know. A bit of a segue from Elizabeth Warren to <laughs> <Yeah>. nerve agents. <laughs> but uh, it was it, rather shocking, but at the same time, not. I mean, I, I've got a friend who works in um, part of the, let's say, the defense establishment. <laughs> and I was talking to him about various things, Russian. And he said, you, you know what we call them? I says, well, no. He says, the Klingons. Now, well, that's a millennial alert. The Klingons were characters <laughs> in Star Trek. You know, you can look it up in Wikipedia. And uh, basically, he said, I said, what do you call them that for? And he goes, well, Klingons are always Klingons. Why would you expect them to do anything else? Oh. So right? So, you know, th this, is, this is what they are. This is who they are. This mm -hmm. is what they do. So they've decided that, you know, part of the fealty to the motherland stuff is if you're a traitor, no matter where you are, we'll come to get you. In fact, there was even a guy on the evening news in Russia who basically said, and now finally, you know, rather than having the cat stuck up a tree story, yeah. I was like, finally, let's talk about traitors. And apparently they did this like segment on how we'll get you wherever you are and it's a dangerous occupation. And then it has a picture of the British government's research facility for weapons, which is called Porton Down, which is where they do chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. So short of actually just walking on a TV with a T-shirt that says, I did it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. they've pretty much admitted to it. Now, the question is, what does Britain do? Because by some accounting, yes. there's been over a dozen of these incidents, and most of them have happened in London or in Britain in mm -hmm, general. Mm -hmm. So Boris Berezovsky, the Litvienko, the mm -hmm. guy who was poisoned, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's like move to London, and then 10 years later, you get <laughs> murdered by the FSB. <laughs> With some sort, sort so, of So what does, what does Britain do about this? So Theresa May has said, well, now we know it really was them because it's a specific energy agent. They're the ones who make it. This just came in Parliament half an hour ago. And uh, therefore, you know, we want them to release the, you know, the technical specifications or whatever to some NGO that does chemical mm -hmm. weapons. Well, that's not going to happen, is it? So what do you do next? Nothing. So, you know, you're dealing with the Klingons. So, I mean, you, there's nothing. I mean, did, she doesn't want to start anything with she Russia over this. What are you going to do? I mean, nothing. I mean, the relationships between the two countries are already pretty much at an all-time low. So let's say you withdraw your ambassador. They withdraw their ambassador. Right. right. Now what? Big deal. I mean, so in some ways, if we think about someone being um, the cost-benefit analysis, I mean, Putin's it's a really good cost-benefit analysis for him to, like, go and, uh, and murder all these old Russian spies because why not? No one's going to do anything. Like, Nobody's going to do anything, do anything to you. And, yeah. you know, you can apparently he just did an interview with Megyn Kelly. Oh, jeez. Did you know this? No, I didn't oh, right. know this. Oh, and uh, she was talking about the elections and interference. And, you know, in classic Putin, he said, well, I don't know who did this. And I'm paraphrasing. But, yeah. you know, it might not even be real Russians. I mean, it could be Belarusians, It could be Jews. It could be people with green cards. Who knows who do this stuff and why? So, wow, there you go. So murder someone in London and then sort of start scapegoating the Jews. Right. Way to go. Wow. Did he do it with a shirt on? Do we know? I think he did it with a shirt uh, okay. on. Okay. All right. Because I could just see him trying to, you know, yeah, finesse, exactly. that, uh, finesse that interview. But to go back to the earlier point, though, this, this could be something about the whole presidente for life thing. Yeah. That once you really begin to think it's okay to be that person, then you begin to behave this way. Yeah. Well, and in the case of Jinping, too, you think there's now not even a thin veneer that they kind yeah. of do this thing. I mean, at least before it was like they kind of do this, at least, you know, with a wink and a nod. But now, I mean, all the, the gloves are off in that regard. So shout out for this. Uh, Lost the other week, I saw a film which it's, it's strangely very hard to see here in the United States. I don't know why. I can't find a, a It was meant to be released last week or this week. I can't find it anywhere around here, right, within 60 miles of Providence. Is The Death of Stalin. Oh, no. Right, so this yeah. is Armando Iannucci. Go, everybody ah. go see this, right? So the guy who did Veep, right? Uh -huh. So it's an incredibly funny film that borders on horror. Because what it is, it's literally the death of Stalin. So basically, Stalin has a stroke, and he lies on the floor all night in a, you know, in a sea of his own urine. And then, uh, you know, Beria and all these clowns show up. And then it's the battle for who's going to be alive at the end of the week. Oh, right? as the and, and the warning is, right, you know, when you have these super authoritarian president for life systems, the problem is these people eventually die. And then when they die, it's utter chaos. Right, so, you know, apropos the moment, everybody should go watch The Death of Stalin because it's strangely hilarious and terrifying at the same time, but also deeply insightful. Um, so uh, picking up on a topic from last week about the tariff wars, very popular. Tariff wars. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no, I thought it was a good musical interlude. So the EU has said in a strong retaliation to the Trump administration, 
if you slap tariffs on our stuff, we're going to slap tariffs on your yeah, stuff. Yeah, that, that's usually what happens. Screw you. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, so Tariffs 101, we did a bit of this last week. So a tariff is basically a way of equalizing external prices to your prices by raising a duty on them. So you're taxing the import, basically, so to protect your domestic producers. Problem, many more people use steel than make steel, so ultimately it's a tax on your domestic consumers. Now, we seem to be upping the ante on this one. The big problem is Germany. So, because right. they're the big, produ- I mean, they're the big dog, right? In the so, and, and you know, he's had <clears throat> him and Peter Navarro, his advisor, have had the German sort of trade surplus in their sites for a while. Now, in comparison to what the Chinese sort of trade surplus, the US, etc., Germany alone is not that big, but Europe runs a surplus against the rest of the world, Asia runs a surplus against the rest of the world, and it's true, the United States is the corresponding deficit. Now, that's not particularly harmful if everybody else wants to hold the money you pay them with. Right. But at the same time, you know, you might want to do something about this to rebalance it mm-hmm. over time. Doing it through tariffs is not very smart, particularly with the Germans. And here's why. Uh, by some accounting, um, the most of the growth that's going on in Germany, at least, and also their supply chain companies, countries in Eastern Europe that assemble the car parts mm-hmm. and all this is really coming from global exports. Hmm. So think about Volkswagen, right? So Volkswagen goes through the big scandal, pays yeah. 40 billion in fines. They're still fine. Yeah. They're still making yeah. money. You can get a Golf wagon, which is a fabulous wagon, for $23,000. Yeah. Now, what happens if you stick a 25% tariff on that? Much more expensive car. That's now a $31,000 car. Yeah. You're going to be looking at a Jeep instead. Yeah. And that protects your domestic consumers, now the producers. Now, you know, you may want to do that, but think about it this way. Germany is actually irrationally proud of its trade surplus. Mm-hmm. I know this is weird to think <laughs> about, right? But they're the only country in the world that runs a trade surplus is a raison d'etat. Mm-hmm. So the only party that's around just now that's gaining votes is the nationalist alternative right. for Deutschland. Right, right. And you can imagine how they're going to play this if basically Brexit ro- yeah. results in tariffs on cars and then Trump puts tariffs on cars and suddenly the Anglos are against us and that's going to play well with the German public. So... This could go in a much darker direction faster than I thought. But even on the policy side of this, and again, I know we talked about this last week as well, is that no one in the White House actually supports this policy, seemingly, now that Gary Cohn has left the administration. I mean, the president, just because it doesn't seem like he has an actual, he maybe does, it's a very complex topic, doesn't fully see the full picture. But, I mean, this seems to be the president out on the limb for his yeah, own I mean, policy. I mean, there's Peter Navarro, who's very gung-ho on this type of stuff. I mean... From an economics point of view, I mean, you know, the, the way we tend to think about it is this old quote from uh, Robert Solow, the economist, yeah. that says that essentially, um, you know, I have a, a trade uh, deficit with my barber because I have nothing yeah. to give him and he gives me haircuts, but I run yeah. a trade surplus with my employer because right. I give him services and he pays me, and then it all sums to zero. Mm-hmm. And as my friend Brendan Greeley um, puts it, um, China is not a barber. I mean, this is like much bigger and the effect that that has on your domestic industries and wages, etc. is actually well known, quantifiable and pretty negative. So there's reasons for being concerned here. Are, is thinking about this in terms of a series of bilateral tariffs a good idea? No, because it's tit for tat. You mm-hmm. do it to me, I do it That's to right. you, and everybody ends up worse off. Right. I mean, it can, you can't, well, I mean, you, you so many different things to say, but it's hard to see that the EU and the U.S. going at this toe-to-toe. I mean, it's, I mean, it's just the you classic th- you, game you of think political not. chicken. I mean, yeah. you know, they used to be always be joined at the hip, but, you know, things that are joined at the hip can often punch each yes. other in the head. That's a great, that's a great point. That's a great point. Speaking of being punched in the head, mm. uh, Marie Le Pen, um, renamed her party over the weekend. Did um, she? I didn't know this. The National Rally. The National Rally. Yeah. Wow. Um, and also odd. had a special guest. Were you invited? Uh, I was. I just couldn't attend. Um, maybe she asked uh, maybe Steve Bannon because you couldn't be there. Oh, so wow. Steve, Steve was there. Steve was there. Um, and he gave this really rousing speech about let them call you xenophobes, let them call you racist, um, and wear that as a badge of pride um, because we're we're winning. Because you are. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you <laughs> yes. Because so you don't, are. So deny you know, who you are. There. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, wow. But I was I also thought it was interesting that there had been so much talk about her and now the French in opinion polls is small, I think like twenty five percent now that actually think that she could be right. could lead the country. So it's just interesting seeing what's hap- what happens after the huge uh, after the Trump wave and how yeah. and how people perceive that. Well remember, you know, if you think about the Trump wave as sort of, you know, the global Trumpism, T M, right? Yeah. But um, <laughs> let's remember but there was this election in Italy. 
Oh, that right. Oh my goodness! I right. didn't even and, cover that. Yeah, yes. And, and remember what happened there? Yes. Five star. Right? Yes. The anti-vaxxer yes. slightly yeah. left party. Yeah. Largest party by two to one. Yes. And then the extremely racist Northern League, mm -hmm. number two. The middle disappears completely. Yeah. Renzi's resigned, I believe, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is far from over. No, actually, this is right. And we, um, I forgot this, um, that we had this election. We had the Italian election, but it's certainly the conclusion has not has not. Now, bring us. this forward to France, right? So what's yeah. going to happen is you've got a bunch of populists who have said, the euro's bad, and uh, they're going to either be sort of out squeezed out by the middle, a la Germany, because you can imagine all the rest of the parties getting together to keep them out, or it's going to be five-star with with someone. Yeah. Now, regardless, they're not actually going to do anything about it because the reasons we spoke about before is the Hotel California mm -hmm. problem. <laughs> yeah. Once you get in, you can't get out. <clears throat> So then people who voted for them will get frustrated because nothing will change again. Mm -hmm. And it's the same as France. Macron's going to try all this stuff. He's going to make some little battle, mm -hmm. some little successes. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, structurally, France is in a bind. The euro may or may not be part of it. But you need the cooperation of the Germans to do a lot more than they're going to be able to do. Mm -hmm. So they're going to get disappointed with him. And, you know, the rally yeah. is not going anywhere. Oh, so it's, a con I mean, the cycle continues. continues. The cycle continues. Um. So we have a couple of questions from students uh, that that were sent to us. Just students? So, yeah, just uh, just students. So, okay. um, hi everyone else. Yeah, <laughs> hello. So Franklin um, from Political Science has a question, and we kind of covered this, but I think actually I like this question because it's a it's a kind of a straight up yes or no. Given the international backlash to the White House's recently proposed tariffs. Could the U.S. fight and win a trade war tomorrow? Ah, no, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, so I think no. I think no, because nobody wins trade wars. I mean, yes. you have to, yeah. like, give me a historical example of a win in a trade war. I wouldn't even know where to look. No, I mean... Maybe the opium wars. Right? Yeah. So basically, you know, you had yeah. a bilateral trade yeah. imbalance with India, yeah. so you got everybody addicted to, 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 <laughs> to opium yeah. in China to yeah. solve the problem. Yeah. Not much of a win. I wouldn't recommend that one highly, no. Um, Annie, now I feel like I'm in a... Um, I'm, Can you do an NPR voice? Yeah, I know. Go on. Annie from Political Science. Um, I'm wondering what the implication of the Economic Growth Regulatory Belief and Consumer Protection Act will be if it passes. Does it increase the chances of another crisis? And you say? Uh, I say yes, 100%. And I say yes, unless everything that we think we know about systemic risk is wrong, which might be. But I wouldn't want to take a gamble on that being true. So just a reminder, this is the um, this is the bill that was before the Senate Banking Committee, right? And the senator, the Democratic senator that voted week. for this. Yeah, that, and the Democrats right. are going on on the ground yeah. that it helps credit unions. Right. But right. basically what it does is it kind of shrinks the provisions for who's systemically important and who's not because they have to carry extra capital as a base mm -hmm. so in case they fall over, all that sort of stuff. So essentially, you know, as we said last time, banking's pro-cyclical, right? When you have a big crash, everyone gets conservative. And then people are conservative for a while, and then the economy improves, and then they go, "Hey, okay. why are all these regulations here?" Yeah. And then they start to take them off, and then you get easy money, and then it goes further and further and further, and and then it yeah. does it again. So yeah. you know, it's one of these ones. File under shocked, yes, surprised, never. Right. Um, oh, interesting segue. Shocked, never. Um, Stormy Daniels. Will she get to do her interview on 60 Minutes? It's a very good question. I mean, you know, you can slap an injunction on someone, I suppose. I don't know the legal ins and outs of this one. But, I mean, it is interesting that sort of people who get ejected from the White House end up in the strangest places. Yes. I mean, you just ended up, you know, <laughs> you were saying Bannon ends up in France, yeah. when, you know, addressing the rally. And now there you have an ex-porn star yeah. who report, reputedly had an affair with the president on 60 Minutes. Just, just imagine if this had been Obama I know. or Clinton or literally anybody else, <laughs> right, that the allegation was tonight at 8 o'clock, Stormy Daniels is going to tell all about the president. Millions of people would tune in. The Senate would be ready to impeach them, all the rest of it. Trump is like, whatever, I think I'll go get a burger. I know, is, is, is it even a blip on the screen? And to be fair, Monica Lewinsky did do an interview with Barbara Walters. Ah. And I think it was millions of people that did. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and like, now you're in. just like, eh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I actually think the talk of that um, was her lipstick. So it wasn't even on oh, the wow, substance there we of, go. Of, uh, of that. Um, 
So as we start to wrap things up, I this uh, stood out <laughs> stood out to me because I know you are um, a Scientology follower. Yes. Now you can follow them play. on TV soon because they're about to start their own channel. Ooh, it's time, awesome. It's time for us to tell our story. That's great. So the their story, as I understand <laughs> it, from uh, an episode of South Park I saw about a <laughs> decade ago, is that um, it goes like this. Have you ever felt sort of less than your capacities? Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt that sort of strange forces are oppressing you? Oh, definitely. Usually <laughs> definitely, on Tuesdays. Yes. <laughs> um, well, here's the truth. Half a million years ago, a bunch of aliens came and enslaved us and we're all in a mind prison. And if you do all of our stuff step by step for a lot of money, we'll free you from the mind prison. I think that's basically it. Yeah, I think that's it. That's yeah. it. Which, you know, when you're given you know, a choice of sort of all of the different sort of religions of the world, I don't even know if that ranks as the most stupid. No, I mean, I think it's, you know, really in line with what a lot of people... Yeah, you know, exactly. Can, can, you know, uh, can I often into. feel depressed by alien forces. <laughs> I feel know. oppressed by alien, oppressed, yeah, uh, yes, exactly. by alien forces as well. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for our first, uh, our first live uh, podcast. We will see you back here in a couple weeks. Hopefully with a GoPro and, like, the Central Committee background's gone. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.